session insurance in digital world please welcome the panelist george castleman president of insurtech asia association chief commercial officer chong antak cleo sent randy founder and ceo pasar polis dr omar shawaldi anwar president director pt prudential sharia life assurance prudential sharia you terry CEO and founder, The Digital Insurer. And the moderator for this session, Karin A. Zulkarnayen, Indonesia Life Insurance Association, AAJI. Selamat pagi semuanya. Good morning everyone. Everybody have your coffee? I'm not sure you do. Can we all stand up please? Can we all stand up? If you see a seat, empty seat in front of you, can you move forward? Can you do me a favor and move forward please? Let's fill up all the empty seats in front. We want to look good in the pictures, don't we, later? So please move up and fill every empty seats in front of you, including you, Pa. Please move forward, Pa. Thank you so much, and please have a seat. Good morning, everyone. And I hope you all are enjoying Bali, and you have had the chance to see the beach and eat good food in Bali. Yeah, welcome to the second day of the Dream Insurance Forum 2022. And today, the 18th of October, it's an insurance day. So what a privilege it is for us to all be here and talk about the topic that we are all passionate about. Yeah. So first of all, I want to give a big round of applause for everyone who are here who've been working for insurance industry over the years. Because of you guys, we managed to see some growth and we are here today. Yeah? Yesterday, on the first day of Insurance Forum, from all the four sessions, we are hearing the same word over and over again. The D word, the digital word. So I'm very happy that we are here to finally speak about this topic, insurance in digital world. So today, I have all the four gentlemen here with me today. Thank you very much, guys. I know that they're all coming from diverse uh, background and expertise. So it really is our big honor to have them uh, with us. So today, to open up the first session of the day, let me invite uh, George Kesselman. George holds an MBA from University of Western Ontario and he's the president of InsureTech Asia Association and chief commercial officer of Chong An Technology. Glad to have you with us, George. The stage is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. I have a privilege of starting you off today and uh, let's uh, keep it keep it light and uh, give you some very interesting information. So I titled it Asia InsurTech Revolution uh, to, to share with you some of the really interesting things. And the way that uh, I, I'm bringing it about is not just from the perspective of uh, Singapore or, or Indonesia or any kind of country in particular, we have an association that's called GITA, which is the 13 InsurTech associations all coming together and uh, bringing together these networks to link up innovation across the world. So th this is really, really powerful because the innovation as we know it actually doesn't know borders. It, it is really about breaking the barriers, uh, breaking the barriers between traditional new countries, uh, regions. So th this is where InsurTech becomes very, very powerful and there are some really interesting things that I wanted to share with you today. There is about 330 InsurTechs in Asia as we speak uh, and there is still a lot more innovation happening on general insurance side. 
So this is, is no surprises, I think, to everybody, uh, but this is just to put the numbers in a perspective. Uh, and at the same time, I think this is later on discussion to say why isn't there more innovation in life insurance and how can we create more innovation because there's so much value and so much opportunities uh, in life insurance as well. Uh, in Southeast Asia economy, uh, internet economy is becoming a much, much bigger part of the uh, overall economy. So things are moving into digital. Uh, I'm sure you experience your kids or your uh, families see that the, uh, in digital is becoming such a massive economy, means that more of our day-to-day -day activities actually move into uh, internet. So $174 billion, it is a really, really big number, and it is continuing to grow very, very rapidly. So why, why is it important to us? Is because this digital economy is driving a lot of things in a digital insurance. Insurance is something that's insuring the risk, uh, and embedded insurance is something that uh, is one of the first waves that started. A lot of the people think about general, uh, general insurance as being that uh, embedded insurance uh, component. So when you open, let's say, GoJack uh, app or when you open Grab, you see this small type of insurance that's starting to appear. But it is happening to life insurance as well. This is an example of a bank that is starting to embed uh, insurance in a very integrated way. So bank assurance is, we, we all know that it's a big component of life insurance, is starting to move into the, uh, very actively into the embedded, into digital. So things like around, here's a savings product that is very simple, that's very easy for the customers to interact with, uh, health products, uh, term products, all this kind of uh, simple insurance is moving into this place. And it's already reached maturity, and then the next one is gonna be really about the growth of the digital insurance, which is going to be a $20 billion U.S. opportunity in, in ASEAN. And the reason why I say ASEAN is because I think even from the mindset of uh, Indonesia, of course, Indonesia is your first market, and you, you need to make sure that uh, you grow here. But as ASEAN opportunities open up, I think there is a tremendous opportunity for the insurers to continue growing, not just in Indonesia, but in the region, to take advantage of this digital opportunity. So it is going to be a very, very sizable opportunity going forward. Uh, and then where, where things are moving next, which I think is also very exciting, is going to be moving into the hybrid arena. And I think this was something that was, I was very pleased to hear the, uh, during the OJK opening address. Uh, the, the message was that hybrid is going to be a big driving factor for digital. So omnichannel, which is basically combining digital and non-digital in a very integrated way, uh, is going to be something that we see as a massive driving force in digital transformation and digitalization. So it's not just going to be purely digital or purely uh, traditional di distribution. It's going to be a very tight combination of both. So here is an example for TikTok. Uh, a, a lot of things are starting to pick up in the social media, the trust and the distribution and how people think about insurance is changing. Is no longer, let's copy paste some of the things that we did in traditional into digital or vice versa, uh, but uh, let's combine it in the new powerful ways. And it is really about uh, very, very c a couple of concepts. So this is the couple of points of success uh, in terms of how we think about uh, insure tech and how do we think about digital. So it is very much about partnerships, products, and people, because those are very, very important ingredients that combine together to drive the change that is there, and it is going to continue much more. So if we talk about some of the things around the partnerships, it, it, we're seeing a lot more of this happening as we speak. So we see uh, banks, uh, digital banks partnering with the insurers in a new ways that are very, very exciting. Uh, companies working together with platforms, uh, and then uh, we also see like technology companies partner with insurers. So that partnership approach, I think, is going to be a very, very important uh, element going forward. So it's just going to be we're insurance, we're going to do everything ourselves. We're you know we have a lot of money, we have a lot of uh, resources. I think 
that has worked up to this point, but going forward is going to be something that much more needed the partnership because it is that building blocks that can be easily combined. So rather than you being your, your own cloud solution, I remember a couple of years back, I had a conversation with Allianz where they said, we're building our own private cloud. Well, they're not building their own private cloud anymore because uh, AWS, Google, Microsoft all build their cloud that's much more advanced, much more core to their business. And it is really about combining those elements and leveraging them so that you can drive the digital transformation. So it, it is very, very exciting. And it is really about the how. So the speed and iteration is really going to be the core of what digital is about. So what does speed mean? means that you need to do faster. If it took you last time six months, eight months to launch a product before you can test it and make sure that it's working, it needs to be six weeks, then six days at some point to really try to experiment, uh, to try to find new exciting products that work. And that iteration is also very, very uh, important because it's not just about we take six days to launch a product and then we leave it for the next two years. It is about we take a month to launch a product, and then we'll continue launching new products to find products that really the, our customers demand. This is the products that they need. Uh, it's addressing their needs. It's addressing what they're looking for. It's clear to them how to, how to internalize and how to use it. So it is very, very important about thinking about that concept much more in terms of iteration and how do you change your people, your teams to be able to really take advantage of that, which is really a total reset. Um, and uh, we, I run the InsureTech Asia Association where basically it brings together the startups, insurers, tech platforms to really connect the dots of how this is going to work in the next phase. So we're very excited about it and I'm really happy to be here with you this morning to have this conversation. Thank you. Big round of applause to George. Thank you, George. I like the three P framework that you put in, but how do we put that into practice? So the next speaker will be Cleo Sandrunding, who have done it, and uh, Cleo hold a Bachelor of Business from Simon Fraser University, Canada, and was awarded as Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year for Technology and Digital in 2018. He is the founder and CEO of Pasar Polis, one of the startup which was invested by our Indonesia's very own tree unicorn. Let's hear it directly from Cleo. Big round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you banget semuanya. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. I think it's really unbelievable to see such a big crowd in Bali early in the morning. So thank you for being here. Uh, really great. I mean, it's... Uh, Usually, a lot of the conferences in Bali, especially early in the morning, people are still, um, you know, I heard just today, I think people are still playing golf, etc. Uh, but I think AAJI crowd is very different. It's also my first time to be in a um, live insurance conference, so I'm here as much uh, to also learn. Uh, but basically, uh, today, I think just want to share a little bit about uh, Pasar Police and our journey. So I uh, just want to talk about three things in, in today's presentation. The first is that uh, we see a massive potential in the market, right, in terms of delivering insurance in a digital world, right, to digital consumers. So I think that's one. Uh, we see such a massive and currently underpenetrated market um, in delivering different type of insurance product or health product to digital consumers, maybe younger generation. That's number one. Second is that I think we'll share about our journey to make distribution of this insurance product in the digital ecosystem. So we partner with about 40 plus partners to deliver insurance to um, the digital consumers, the millennial. And the third is uh, I want to maybe share with you and learn as well. Um, and I want to maybe I hope that today we can uh, chat, etc., to really figure out how can we build innovative products to really meet these new emerging consumers. So the first is uh, insurance in Indonesia. 
right, um, has such a massive white space, especially in regards to the, you know, maybe digital ecosystem. Why is that? Um, I, I was informed that uh, this forum has a lot of people from overseas as well. And many of us don't realize that Indonesia spans from, you know, maybe LA to New York in terms of size. It has 70% of the US population. And we see such a big potential of these emerging consumers to buy their first insurance. And if we take a look, insurance penetration rate in Indonesia, the insurance density, and how our GDP has grown, we actually see that I think insurance is at the cusp of that. And especially in many countries, like for example in China and uh, India, for example, we see that after the digital banking boom, the digital insurance boom will happen. So we see that um, when the first digital insurance in China license was approved, we see the growth to be 26 times in a period of eight years. So we see clearly that Indonesia is at the brink of you know, transformation where digital insurance will become more prevalent, digital insurance product. Uh, and how we at Pasarpolis uh, do it is we built our first few years of our journey, we focus on distribution of insurance product. So how do we build the insurance product is by making partnership because we believe that we want to build insurance product not as a financial product, and I think many people think of insurance as a financial product. We want to build insurance product that actually fits from customer life perspective because no one in Indonesia goes on a bright Saturday morning or Sunday morning and think about buying insurance. What they care is living their life. And if we see it from that, we actually want to embed insurance into, into all of the, uh, you know, basically whatever people try to do, whether they want to go right on Gojek, they want to buy their gadget at Shopee and all these things, how can we make insurance comes to them as opposed to people actually have to buy insurance. So we make the insurance purchase really, really seamless. And as a result, um, when we make the insurance to be very seamless, uh, that it is frictionless, right? Uh, and also the right product, we would be able to get a lot of customers. Uh, what we have done is really to make sure that we embed it and Pasarpolis leads in terms of building insurance, whether it's in e-commerce, in consumer lifestyle, we have exclusive uh, partnerships with the likes of, you know, Xiaomi, Ikea, and many other, many of these partnerships. Uh, and, and I think what we want to do is to embed more and more products, right? Uh, we have now issued over uh, a billion policies to about, you know, maybe 20 million or more customers. And we think that these customers can buy different type of product. So today, what we believe is a question because we cannot do this alone. Indonesia is such a massive potential. And what we truly want is the partnership from you know, folks like you. It is people like you that can really innovate and create product that really meets and align with the customer life cycle. Uh, so we do believe that people's life, they need different type of insurance product. And we hope to be able to find more strategic partnerships with folks like you, with people like you, that really delivers insurance to customer. Uh, and really not think of insurance as a large financial product, uh, but really make insurance to be relevant to customer needs and bring it to be seamlessly part of their day-to-day uh, -day journey. So these are some of the products that we have done, really building more and more and we hope to be building more. I mean, we hope to be able to do uh, people's first health insurance, 
together with the you know people and partnership that are in this room. So, you know, we have our you know also um, our uh, platform where people make the claims, and you know millions of people have made claims and buy insurance, and we want to basically uh, you know use uh, this moment to also sell them the next insurance, and I think we want to find a way to build innovative products together. Uh, but really, um, I think at the end of the day, uh, what keeps me awake at night is to realize that people in Indonesia that needs insurance the most don't have insurance. And I think it is our uh, work together to make and really to make insurance for all to be a reality. Yeah. So I think there is a short video just about the things that we do. Thank you. Can we have the volume, please? Uh, Pajar. Uh, saya uh, driver Gojek. Saya tinggal uh, lahir Jakarta. Bapak, bapak kerja apa sih? Ojek juga sih. Nah, baru bisa kan uang saya setelah cari yang program dari pasar polisi itu ya kan. Ngebantu banget untuk pasar polisi ini ngebantu banget untuk saya pribadi. Gitu. Pasar polisi is Indonesia's largest digital insurance. What we have done is really build great distribution of insurance through technology. Initially, in the pandemic, a lot of the drivers of Gojek or others, they have less income. So we launched, and, and being very adaptive, we launched a Mitra app, which is basically allowing different people to sell insurance as an agent, but through our app. So the onboarding is done through the app. We have videos, quizzes. It allows people to be digitally onboarded and training. And then we also have refresher, etc. as well. Kalau cerita dari awal, saya ikut apa namanya uh, pasar polis nih, ikut dari mitra nih, dari mitra ke mitra ya kan, cari orang. Saya alhamdulillah dapat uh, 20 orang nih, ya kan 20 orang. Karena yang sudah-sudah karena kan oh asuransi apa gimana nggak tahu kan. Akhirnya setelah saya membuktikan bahwa asuransi ini memang benar ada uh, faktanya ada, terus turun ke ke saya gitu cair lah ibaratan gitu kan. Sampai-sampai banyak yang pada oh mau dong asuransi, oh mau dong ini apa gimana kayak gitu. One of the barriers that we are seeing, right, and what we are solving is really not about only the education of insurance, but I think even more prevalence is actually the friction. I think there is so much to be done in terms of removing friction from insurance, really making insurance to be simple. And when we can do that, we truly see that insurance can really be affordable for a lot of different people. Nah, kan alhamdulillahnya dia bilang, ah, coba. Gue pengen tahu nih, ya kan? Saya belikan karena kan waktu itu kan ada program dari pasar polis, alhamdulillah. Nah, pas saya bapak saya beliin, uh, sebulan, uh, beberapa bulan kemudian sakit, ya kan? Sakit-sakit, tahan meninggal. Nah, jadi, jadi pas uh, tiga bulan, uh, semenjak pembelian pertama pasar polis itu, saya klaim bisa katanya. Jadi masih ada, nggak nggak mati lah ibarat itu uh, pasar polisnya gitu kan? Nah, di Rusia saya bersyukurnya itu, bersyukurnya. Ngerasa ngurusin lah gitu, ngerasa ngurusin orang tua saya gitu kan. We've seen the business growing to uh, about you know seven times year on year, and we are reaching 80 million customers. We have issued more than a billion policies, and all of that cannot scale if we don't have AI. How we actually create dynamic underwriting through AI, being able to create price differentiation, for example, risk selection. But I think what's even more prevalent of the use of AI is to really build claim infrastructure. Insurance is really, in my mind, something that is about chances. And I think that we may have forgotten that basically the people who need insurance the most in Indonesia are the people who don't buy insurance.
big round of applause to Cleo and Pasar Police. Thank you for showing us how we can be innovative and make insurance simple. Now, um, it was a great example from a startup, but how would a big insurance company, an incumbent and market leader, be innovative with technology? Up next is Dr. Omar Ashawaldi Anwar. Be careful, Pa Omar. <laughs> He holds PhD in Strategic Management from University of Indonesia. He has more than 30 years of experience in various strategic leadership in different industries, ranging from banking, capital market, mining, and energy. He is the President Director of Prudential Sharia Life Assurance. Welcome to Dream Stage, Pa Omar. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Karen. Thank you for the introduction. I almost fell. I didn't see the white line. Uh, there's a risk standing in front of you as well. So I need insurance for that. <laughs> Am I covered by Pastor Police? No. Okay. I'm, uh, good morning, everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Salam sehat. Dan saya melihat, this is, uh, this is the last day of the insurance. Um, I'm going to give a context about our experience at Prudential. A little bit of the context on the I on the ASEAN front, and plus also in Indonesia. Um, this is a multiple choice question, very simple. As of June 2022, what is the percentage of internet connectivity of the 600 million population in ASEAN, in which about 275 million people are, are Indonesian? The answer is B, 75%. Second question, what about Indonesia? What is the internet penetration? The answer is also B. So what does that context mean? Actually, that means digital economy is here to stay. When you look at 70%, 77% of the internet penetration in Indonesia alone, that means about 210 million people that has access to the internet, that has access to the mobile device, that has access to the desktop, to the laptop, to the iPads, to the tab of the various brands that we carry on a day-to-day -day basis. We in Prudential, we've been in Indonesia for 27 years. We have been blessed to have received the trust of the Indonesian people to take care of their health, to take care of their protection, and plus also to be able to provide the financial resiliency of the everyday Indonesian people. These are just the numbers, you know, COVID, we have been through for the last two years. COVID has been a mixed blessing. It is a sad day, it was a sad two years that we've seen people all around us passing away. But also at the same time, it is a time of transformation. It is a time of digital transformation to be exact. Let me share with you a little bit about Prudential Indonesia, our ecosystem, what we have done, what we have built. And this is more or less the way we see the market in Indonesia from Prudential perspective, is how to respond to the market needs. It's how to respond to the customer needs. Therefore, we have what we call Pulse. If you download through Google Play or the Apple Store, Pulse, is an embodiment, embodiment of what we have on the digital apps, on a digital front. It is an ecosystem. So when you talk about digital, you talk about ecosystem. It provides access to health features. It provides consultation and telemedicine, protection, treatment. And lately, we are also building our spiritual wealth and plus also our spiritual well-being apps, which is still a work in progress. Now, Prudential Indonesia, we took a leap of faith back in 2019 through our group office in the headquarters. We launched the first Pulse in Malaysia in 2019, followed by Indonesia in 2020. And as of today, we have nearly 30 million downloads regionally, and plus also 10 million downloads in Indonesia alone. It is a symptom of checker and health. It provides a twin biological self 
of us, of you and me, when you subscribe to The Pulse. It is telemedicine, it is hospital finder, it is wealth ecosystem. So these are the ecosystem that we are building through our digital apps. So that was a glimpse of uh, what we did for the uh, digital apps uh, at Prudential. We, last month, on the 27th of September, uh, we were blessed also and we had a chance to launch our Sharia Knowledge Center. We, back in April of 2022, we launched the Prudential Sharia. We spun off uh, the company, uh, the subsidiary, into a subsidiary. And we launched a Sharia Knowledge Center simply because what we know about this market, what we know about Indonesia, literacy is one of the big challenges of the insurance industry. And primarily, the Sharia Knowledge Center uh, rests on three pillars. One is to disseminate the information and education. Number two is the collaboration. We cannot work alone. We need to work with the government. We need to work with the regulator. We need to work with other organizations so that literacy becomes less and less difficult for the average Indonesian. And lastly, it's also a pillar of the product and innovation. We work together with Dewan Sharia National, with MUI, try to find out, try to brainstorm what are some of the products and services that we need, that the customer needs, that the average Indonesian needs. So these are the three pillars. There's, there's one insight, and this is particularly true for the Sharia subsidiary that we just launched in April of 2022. There is one research that I want to share with you, and uh, this is done through 5,000 respondents uh, just recently, a couple of months ago, and this is mainly about the literacy, and to answer yesterday's panel speaker uh, question about the literacy challenge, um, what we find out the purchase intention of Sharia, which is a huge untapped market. About 240 million people in, in Indonesia are Muslim. We found out that 58% of the respondents like and intend to purchase the Sharia products. However, what we, what we find out, and this is too small to see, maybe, but what we find out even though the digital apps may assist the intention to purchase, it's trending up from a low 2% to 9%. Insurance is a complicated product. Therefore, they need assistance. And what is the number one source of assistance for your average Indonesian? And this is the challenge that we face for literacy. The number one source for literacy to help reduce the literacy issues in the industry is through family and friends, apparently. So therefore, um, we in Prudential, it remains a challenge for us. On an everyday basis, we try to tweak, we try to change, we try to experiment our digital uh, apps. The digital journey will not end because Indonesia is a large country. I think this is my last slide. Okay. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pak Omar. Big round of applause. Thank you for showing us that it is a challenge, but there are ways for us to bridge that gap between the knowledge of the people and how technology can help that. The next speaker will um, Hugh Terry. He, we, will listen, uh, we will hear from him on how in this change and digital transformation, we also need to change from the mindset and the way we work. Hugh has more than 25 years of experience starting in actuarial and consulting function, and he has been in Asia since the late 90s. He is currently the CEO and founder of the digital insurer. Hugh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, Salamat pagi. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, 
uh, back in Bali after, for me, three years uh, where I was last at the ASEAN Insurance Congress. And I want to congratulate uh, Sati and also the rest of the uh, organizing committee for putting on such a professional uh, event today. And I think we're all benefiting uh, from that. It's really good to be here. Now, in the time available, and I guess in opening remarks, I wanted to cover two things, or try and cover two things. First of all, I wanted to try and consolidate the fantastic things the other speakers were talking about from a strategic perspective and the long-term trends that are making this digital transformation unstoppable. But then I wanted to dive a little bit deeper and get into something we don't actually talk about enough when we talk about technology, which is ourselves and people and what help we need to be able to move into this digital age. So that's my objective, is those two areas. For those that don't know uh, the Digital Insurer, or TDI, we've been around for about 10 years. I'm based in Singapore, uh, and we're all about knowledge and learning on digital insurance. So we've got a platform you can go and sign up for free, get the information you want, and we also work with companies on more formal learning and development in digital insurance. Now let's start by looking a little bit at people, but let's just look at those customers. Uh, and let's remind ourselves how important they are with this little clip uh, from Jeff Bezos. You might have heard this, but it's, uh, it's worth uh, playing again. But the number one thing that has made us successful by far is obsessive compulsive focus on the customer as opposed to obsession over the competitor. And I talk so often to um, other CEOs and uh, some other CEOs and also founders and entrepreneurs, and I can tell that even though they're talking about customers, they're really focusing on competitors. And it is a huge advantage to any company if you can stay focused on your customer instead of your competitor. So then you have to identify who is your customer. Um, so at the Washington Post, for example, is the customer the people who buy advertisements from us? No, the customer is the reader. Full stop, the customer is the reader. And then, by the way, where do advertisers want to be? Advertisers want to be where there are readers. So it's really not that complicated. You know, it sort of, it comes around really well. So we heard some, some great remarks about focusing on the customer. And I think it's something in the insurance industry we've sometimes forgotten. Um, but what I want to do is, is look very quickly at uh, what these five, what we call key long-term trends, which mean that digital is here to stay. And there's a few frameworks here, which I hope you'll find interesting uh, and thoughtful, um, and you might reflect on uh, a little bit later. So the first one, um, and excuse if there's a little bit um, small, is really just telling us how important consumers are, how consumers leapt ahead during COVID into this digital age, and a reality that we as an insurance industry are way behind other industries in terms of the adoption of technology. So guess what? Consumers leap ahead, we're behind. If we don't move really quickly, we're gonna get even further behind uh, in this area. So although we're moving out of COVID, this is still on the agenda and our consumers, behaviors, buying habits, requirements are changing. The second framework here uh, is called an InsurTech wheel, and it reminds us there's two ways that we can use technology. One is to improve what we do today, what we call value chain innovations. The other is how we can use digital to become part of new digital business models. So there's enormous opportunity in both of these areas, irrespective of where you work in the business. The third one, and Clearson really showed us how already in Indonesia we've moved away from just having a physical first distribution model to one which also has digital micro where hundreds of millions of policies are being sold. Unbelievable, really. We would never have thought that 10 years ago would be in this position. The fourth diagram, which is another key thing, is actually our product is changing. So if we previously said we are there to pay the claim for the customer, absolutely true, absolutely vital. But actually, is that what the honest customer wants? Most customers don't want to make that claim, right? So how can we provide new digitally enabled services to help customers to manage their risks, to avoid risks in the first place? This is where the products are moving at the moment. And the last one, the sort of target, reminds us the customers in the middle 
but actually increasingly those customers are not coming to us directly. They're coming through ecosystems and platforms such as Passapolis, such as others, uh, e-commerce players, etc. So these, for, for me, are the five key trends that we have. Uh, and we think the distribution landscape is going to move into something like this, right? We had life insurance advisory. We had bank insurance come in to the scene 20 years ago. We're now seeing platforms and ecosystems uh, developing. And they are slightly different because ecosystems create opportunities for our existing distribution channels as well. So it's a bit of a mistake to say, oh, well, these platforms are, are different. We can ignore them because we've got our existing channels. We need to work out how to enable our face-to-face -face sales forces into those new ecosystems. So uh, I think, I hope you agree that what we've seen with COVID is the future, right, of what is happening and what will continue to happen in digital. And it makes the option of business as usual suddenly the riskiest option. So change is on the agenda. And the question is, how do we manage that change? Um, and as we all know, um, practice is harder than theory, right? And a lot of digital transformations uh, are not successful. This data from PwC says that 75% of transformations fail to achieve their return um, on investment. Um, and the key to that, of course, is us. So we are the secret to successful transformation. The technology is here. The question is how do we uh, adapt to that? And what we see um, at TDI really, um, and there's lots of data to support this, is three critical problems, challenges that we need to overcome. Number one is we do not have enough digital skills. This is true generally, but actually, specifically, when you look at the data within the insurance industry, again, the insurance industry is more challenged than other industries in terms of developing and attracting talent. Companies know this. Employees know this as well. So there's a skills gap we've got to overcome. The second one, even softer, is around culture and how important culture is within organizations. And how can we move in this digital age to adopting a digital culture to enable not just individuals, because it isn't an individual game, it's a team game. How do we get teams incentivized, enabled to be able to be part of this digital transformation? And the last aspect is the pace of change. So we look at technology, it's moving so quickly, but we ourselves are bound by our DNA, right? And it doesn't change that quickly. So without help, Without thought, we are going to struggle to get up to speed as well. So there's no single answer to this, and maybe in the panel we'll get into it in a little bit more detail. What we've done at TDI Academy, because we focus on the knowledge space, is build learning and development programs that hopefully address some of these issues and, and in our own small way, help organizations and people to take full advantage of this digital age. It's a very exciting time that we've got. It's also very challenging. But I would say as a provocation to the industry as a whole, we spend millions on technology, we spend millions on people's salaries, but we sometimes struggle to spend a very small amount on learning and development. For me, this is a big mistake and we need to invest more in ourselves so that we can take full advantage of this transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you for the reminder that digital transformation is basically about the people. Thank you, Hugh. Now we're going to do something a little bit different. Can I invite everybody to stand up, please? We need to get some energy into the room. And for the committee, can we have the Slido slide, please? Can I ask um, everyone to scan this QR code and get into Slido because the next topic we're going to discuss on the stage is decided by you. Yes, you, not the committee, because we listened to you and you just reminded us that the customer is most important and you are my customer today. So let's listen to what you have to say. Okay, let's go to the Slido and let's put up the first question. You may sit down now, thank you. Now that I know you're on Slido, you may sit down. Now, let's, let's see this. How far is your company in your digital journey? From 1 to 10, 
one being barely started, ten, we've got everything we want. Let's see. 26 have responded, 43, 57. Let's hear more. Oh, this is exciting. Where do you think we will end up here? Six? Eight? <laughs> Can we have more? 81 people have responded. Well, do we have more? This feels like a quick count to me. <laughs> I can't wait. What is the final score? Hmm. Are we there yet? 92, 93? Not bad. I think we can say that we're about six something in our digital journey. Let's ask our panelists. Maybe I'll ask George first. George, any comments on why do, we, do you think or why would the audience think we're on the six right now? Not 10, not one, six. Six is kind of average, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see the score as being six. Uh, and, and, and I would argue that uh, we're, we're probably a little bit even further because I think w when we look at uh, our digital journey, a lot of the times we compare it to the peers and say, okay, actually compare it to everybody else in insurance, I feel like I'm kind of ahead. So if you say, funny enough, if you ask people what, how good of a driver they are, the, the answer is generally also about six or seven, but it, it cannot be because on average, you, everybody is the average driver, right? So I, I think in that sense, uh, we still have a a way to go when it comes to digitalization. And I think as, as the world starts to change, it almost feels like the score is gonna reduce. We're gonna realize just how far behind we are. And uh, one of my suggestions uh, and, and a thought for next year would be to be more external people. Let's, let's hear from Gojak, let's hear from uh, other participants in the ecosystem, even maybe from, from outside. It, it might blow your mind, right? Why, why don't we bring Amazon here as well, right? It might blow your mind just how much the world have moved forward. Um, and we'll also put a more pressure on us to say, can we do more? Thank you, let's hear from Pasar Polis, who is here. Cleo, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think definitely the potential of life, um, especially the more nascent, like for example, health in really owning the digital ecosystem is massive. And if we realize that, there are still so much to be done. Um, so I think that whatever the score is, uh, I really feel with the collaboration. And really it's great to see, you know, life insurance that are doing so well in, in agency and all this thing to really talk about digital. So for me, it's a very refreshing thing. Whatever the score is, I think there is much to be done um, and much potential to, to be generated, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Cleo. A lot more opportunities to be done. Let's pick up on that. I, I wonder, what is the current challenge that stops us from moving from six to the 10? Let's put up the second question. Back to you, ladies and gentlemen. What is your current challenge? And please summarize it into one word so that it can appear on the screen. What is your institution challenge in implementing all your digital journey? What stops you from moving to 10? People, regulation, people and culture, skill, OJK? <laughs> Cost, IT resources, CU. What CU means? Utilization, compliance, digital data. Oh, it gets more interesting. People, you, you might be right, huh? People are right at the center. <laughs> Cost, regulation. We've got 63 responses so far. You can submit more than one. One word. So if you think there are more complex problems, more complex challenges, Please put in as many words as you think is relevant so we can pick it up and discuss it on stage. Let's start with you, Hugh. People seem to be at the center of this change. And why is that? Because I think everyone knows that that is actually what 
is the main challenge, right? It's how we individually and also how we collectively within our organizations have to step up uh, and do this. And it's not just about companies investing, right? Which they should and they do underinvest in my view in this, but it's also about all of us as individuals realizing that things are changing very quickly. So we can't rely on our previous education and knowledge to remain relevant. So we've actually got to commit ourselves to lifelong learning. And that means a real commitment, right? And it means actually you've got to ask yourself, how hungry are you? How hungry are you to drive this digital transformation? Because the leaders of the future are going to be the ones that are the hungriest that take this uh, forward as well. So my advice for those coming through is you know, get fully up to speed on digital uh, on all of the aspects, including these people aspects and change management, which is so, so important as well. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, let me just remind all of you, ladies and gentlemen, if you have further questions to any of the pa panelists over here, you can submit your question also through the slide. Though. Let me ask next, uh, Pa Omar. Pa Omar, you, you can read all these um, comments from the audience, and you've been slightly ahead of all of the rest of the audience in terms of the digital journey, being the market leader, and various innovations that you have done in the past in insurance as well as other industries. Do you agree with these challenges? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that people comes out on top there's regulation, there's cost, of course you need money in order to start, but there are two schools of thoughts in my view. Uh, if a company wants to enhance their digital journey, one is to become a first mover advantage in which Prudential did back in 2019. But what we learn is uh, digital journey is very dynamic. That means we have to continually adjust ourselves. We have to continually experiment because uh, customers change, environment change on a daily basis. Um, the other school of thoughts is approaching digital as a late mover advantage. And we see that in Google. We see that in other large tech company that started later, but in a way they have learned from the early phase or the failures of the successes. Of, of the competitors and then make a better mousetrap, make a better widget, so that in a way, they respond better to the customer, customer needs. But in the final analysis, at the end of the day, it is about responding to the customer's needs. Thanks, Palmer. So far, we've been discussing as to how digital can be the answer of our two days topic in this forum, that is to support the strong, inclusive and sustainable recovery. But now, what else do we need? I mean, it seems to be we're in agreement that digital is a must-have, that it is by default the one thing that we must all do together. So the third question is what support do we need from regulator, from the association? What kind of support? And we really like to hear this from you. We all have been there. Some of us are more ahead, some are just at the beginning, but what are the support needed? Open mindset. Supportive regulations, regulations, ecosystem, equal level playing field, education, understanding industry. Regulation seems to be coming up at the top of the support we need. Sandbox regulation, speed process review, mindset again, clarity, incentive, best class support, data protection, regular talk, fairness, Simplification, freedom of thought, clarity, again, equal treatment. Let me ask you, Cleo, any thoughts in reading these comments from all the insurance players? What comments have you got or inputs for us? Yeah, I think we have this discussion um, 
actually similar questions at the AFTEC where we, uh, the FinTech Association of Indonesia and where we, uh, Pasar Polis, uh, chair the InsureTech Committee. And I think OJK at that time asked about how can we educate um, people to buy more insurance product. But I think what we decided and what we discussed was that uh, when I hear regulation, I think the most challenging problem in Indonesia is the friction, right? Um, insurance in Indonesia has a lot of friction, uh, such as, for example, the seamlessness of claim. And I think that is something that we, the association, uh, needs to together work on to figure out. Uh, I see sandbox is amazing because in many countries, we talk about G20, G20 is happening. In many of G20 countries, I think that product, especially when it talks about micro, for example, it doesn't make sense if the approval process is months and months, right? So how can we create, um, you know, sandbox or allowing different product innovation? We wanted to, for example, insure a bicycle at that time, uh, bicycle insurance because it was happening. But then the, the process is like, a quite a long time, by the time that it got approved, everybody already has their bike, right? So, uh, you know, how can we work together? I think that's amazing, uh, but I think regulation comes quite on top, is the flexibility, and to allow, um, you know, maybe a sandbox approach could be very interesting. No, exactly, that's exactly what we need, but currently we need to go through all the process um, approval that sometimes takes a bit long <laughs> for us to be able to innovate a lot more. But George, <laughs> I saw that you wanted to say something. Yeah, I think it's, it's very interesting because I, I'm, I feel I find myself in a bit of a privileged position because I've had a chance to interact with the regulators and across a few countries in across Asia. Um, and their question is always, why can't the insurance industry be more innovative? Why can't there be more innovation coming in from insurance industry? So I feel like it's very, there is a bit of a disconnect between insurance industry and, and the regulators. It's, it's, in some ways, it's easy to say uh, it's somebody else's fault that we cannot do more innovation. So I, I think there is, needs to be a more proactive approach to that conversation to say, okay, why don't we, we have, let's say next time we have a regulator on the panel to talk about you know, how can we create more innovation together? Because I think beginning of the conversation is very, very important. Uh, and uh, innovation really means also about taking risks. Uh, I, I find a lot of the times, for example, that uh, in insurance companies, compliance will say, we cannot do this. And you ask them, why can't we do this? We think that the regulator will not allow it. They say, did you ever talk to the regulator? No, we never, we never did. So I, I think there needs to be that kind of a proactive thought and proactive approach to that as well. Thank you so much. I hope all these comments are being captured so that we can move on and bring some proposal, right? As to wh how we can make it uh, clearer and what kind of regulation do we need next to, to allow us to innovate uh, in a faster mode. Hugh. Yeah, I wanted to, I guess, um I don't know whether it's philosophized, but, but just reflect really that a lot of regulations have been developed through historical problems, right? So you develop a regulation because there's a problem with selling, right? Um, and that worked in a very static environment, but in an environment where we've actually got completely new methods of distribution, what we have effectively is legacy regulations that don't apply to these new methods of distribution, these new products that are being created. So it's a problem, right? Um, now, one way out of this, which would probably be too bold for many, but would be to say, let's move away from regulations that specify rules that you have to follow to ones which specify principles that you have to follow. And if you could move to a principles-based approach to regulation in a digital world and say, you can do this, follow these principles, and by the way, if you don't do that, we're going to tell you off and we're going to sanction you, that will enable an innovation to happen. So I don't know whether you could box out some of this and say, hey, here's an opportunity for us to think about a new way uh, of regulating as well. Thank you. I think it's, it's very interesting move away from actually the regulation to principles. Yeah. Let's see how far, whether we can change um, that kind of approach to allow us to be more flexible in terms of um, our innovation experiments. 
Pa Omar, do you have any comments on this? How is it compared to other industries? Yeah, I think in, in my experience from the banking side, um, it's one thing unique uh, when you compare banking to uh, insurance. Uh, that is the trust level is higher on the banking industry compared to the, to the insurance industry. In the insurance industry, insurance products and services, insurance needs, is primarily a secondary or a tertiary needs of the average Indonesian. Whereas in banking, I think histor through historical education, through the high school and junior high school education, savings has been embedded in the education system and therefore it is more accepted compared to the insurance. So therefore the challenge for us, be that as it may, the challenge for us is how to increase the literacy um, in the previous speaker last yesterday was mentioned about digital inclusion in terms of the literacy uh, uh, avenue in order to increase uh, the understanding of the insurance products. It is complex. It is not an everyday natural things. So somehow I, I, I applaud the way Pasar Polis how, somehow was able to embed the insurance products and services into the everyday thing of their partners so that insurance becomes a seamless, becomes invisible, so that naturally you're covered through digital bite-sized uh, products and services that you don't feel. You know, in, in Prudential, an example of Prudential, we also have a, a very simple product, 8,000 rupiah, which is less expensive than a cup of coffee kananga. Uh, you can get yourself covered. Just 8,000 perak, bapak dan ibu semuanya and you can go through the, uh, our apps. So how we make it easy, how we make it seamless, how we make it ubiquitous, I think that's, uh, that continues to be a challenge. Indonesia is large, Indonesia is huge. Uh, Jakarta alone is about 50% of the GDP of the country, but then you have the other cities, you have the rural uh, needs and, 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 uh, and uniqueness, uh, which needs to be served in, in a different way. Uh, the, the market is segmented, so how do we serve? So digital, yes, I think regulation is there, but I also, uh, not in defense of the regulator in Indonesia, but what I also learned about the regulation in Indonesia, it is a little bit more open than our, uh, our, our neighbors, our neighboring countries. We, are, we can engage and we can do intensive dialogue with them uh, in, in order for us to launch uh, our digital products, our digital apps, uh, together with the regulator. So actually there's nothing that's holding us back. And what I dread is to have one of our competitor from China coming down to Indonesia, bring their technology, and then they sweep the market. So that means I, I think uh, the context that I gave uh, through the uh, uh, the the entrenchedness of the digital economy where 80% of the population in ASEAN uh, has done one transaction in the digital economy and that is here to stay. So that means whether we like it or not, we need to have a digital, uh, we need to enhance our digital platform in order to serve our customers better. Thank you, Palmer. The committee, do we have any questions from the Slido? Or does anybody Want to ask any question to any of the panelists? You can put your hands up. Okay, please, can we have the mic? Can we have the mic, please? Let me just come down. Yoshika Wai from OECD. And First of all, thank you so much. It's so dynamic and exciting panel that, you know, I think today's panel is the very best from all, our, all you know, panels, the discussion. And just because what you have proposed is a real solution oriented. So that's, I really appreciate what you have done. And the key message that I've got is uh, people, as you mentioned, is, but my question is how, you know, a little bit deeper of the people question. Assuming that all of us have enough tech people, then is it still possible to integrate this digital transformation in Indonesia? Question. Cleo's company 
is excellent example to you know to succeed this digital transformation but my question to other audience or other panelists is if you have a people still possible to do that you said you culture key challenge maybe of course regulator is a challenge but the, your your point of friction is a regulator is a friction but in the, in addition to before the regulator my question to you is traditional company incumbent company like you know companies big company culture can be changed if those integrated in is it possible that those tech people can be integrated in traditional company and create like Cleo's company so this is also the relationship to your existence or culture and people's questions so that's my question thank you Thank you yeah. for the question. Pa Omar, do you want to take that? <laughs> yeah. I'm, and I'm we'll going to come speak. to you, Hugh. Okay, thank you, Karen. I'm going to speak from the experience of a large multinational company. And thank you for the question. It is a multifaceted question. Um, when you look at the age demographics of Indonesian, 55% are millennial and Generation Z, or what we call zillennial. So I'm very confident. I'm very optimistic that the future of Indonesia, and there's another statistic that says that despite the global disruption, despite the macroeconomic headwinds, if we, are, if we continue to show in terms of the, digital, the, the usage of the digital apps, we will overtake the rest of the world, except China, in terms of our propensity to use digital channel in order to buy products and services, whether it be insurance or non-insurance products. So I'm very confident if I look at the demographic for the next eight years, for the next 10 years, that digital economy is here to stay. So therefore, multinational company, large companies or Indonesian companies, it behooves us to respond to these needs because these millennial, these Generation Z, they are digital savvy. One of the panel yesterday uh, asked the question, is there anybody who carries three handphones? I'm one of them for different needs uh, of my personal needs. So I'm very confident that one way or another, the generation, the market, the people itself will force us to respond in order to serve them better, digitally or non-digitally. However, the surveys that we have done, there is an issue on literacy that needs to be challenged, that needs to be addressed as well. That means digital can, on a standalone basis, cannot survive. It has to be high tech and high touch on a combination. Indonesians still love the touch, the engagement, the people engagement in order to close the sale, particularly for insurance, because it is complex. That's my perspective from uh, a company. Thank you, Palmer. You? Yeah, so it's a good question. And I, I kind of alluded to, at the end, look, there's no one answer to this. And I think I'd start with that. And then I'd also add, um, incumbents shouldn't be too worried because they also have a lot of strengths uh, as well. And, you know, life insurance is nothing but a long-term industry as well. So we're not talking about suddenly the industry being upended. There is still enough time, but the question is, is you know, to start moving because otherwise you do get behind and, and, and we're already starting to see those insurers that have moved ahead uh, are starting to get advantages as well. So I think specifically, you know, there's a number of things that organizations could look at. I think one is to start at the top. Uh, and actually, we need to be humble, right? So we talk about the new generation that's coming through that are digitally native. What can we learn from them? Okay, how do we have to reorganize ourselves? How do we change ourselves from being command and control orientated? How do we change ourselves from saying we love running a particular function to actually thinking more like servant leaders? How do we serve our young people coming up in the organization and help them to do their jobs, help them to move faster, help them to be more agile. Because in a sense, we as older people do not represent the future. And we need to, rep we need to recognize that, right? And we need to actually proactively 
build that future, which is going to be very different and sometimes challenging because certain things we remember, certain values we have, may not be the values that are going into the future as well. And, and I think these are realities that we need to pick up on. And then, of course, there's the whole area of how do we then help people across the whole organization to do that? How can we share knowledge with each other, whether that's informal knowledge sharing internally, how do we reach out, do more formal learning as well? Those things, I think, are really important. And it's long term, right? to make that happen. But I think if you can do that, it'd be very successful. And then specifically on technology, you know, there are some exceptions that say some insurers have become very good at technology and, and I have very, very good tech dev. But you don't necessarily need that because you've got lots of technology out there. And I would encourage organizations to think about partnerships, right? You don't have to do everything. So go and look at those insure techs that have already got great technology and work out how to partner with them to move faster. Uh, as well, because the war for tech talent itself is is really really tough. Thank you for reminding us back to the three P that George talked about earlier on, and go back to what George, Jeff Bezos uh, was saying. We need to focus on the customer. So when the customer change, we also must change in the way the business model included on how we can be closer to the customer, make purchase simple, make insurance products simple. I saw just now there was another hand in the middle. Um, can we have the mic, please? Okay, thank you. My, my name is Paul. I just asked uh, simple questions to the, to the panelists because we, we saw that on the uh, Slido that uh, most of the distractions of the digital adoption is people and then also uh, regulation and also we need to think about customer. May I ask to the panelists in your organization or your experience among the staff, the people that you have, how many people, how many percentage are working for uh, IT and programmer? How many percentage work for the customers? Meaning like uh, customer journey, customer pleasing the customer, everything. And how many percents are working on products? Because that will be an eye opener for us. Like for example, there are some people that think that they are at the 10 of the digital transformation. I mean, we, we need to know, because it is without benchmark, right? So we need to know the benchmark. If you are saying that you are 10 on your digital transformation, how many percents uh, working towards that? Because I believe in insurance company, is uh, IT people is around 10% of our staffs. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the question. Who would like to take on this question? Would you like I to can, take it, can start. George? Yeah. So I think the, I, I, my day job is in the Zhongang Tech, which is basically the tech arm of the Chinese insurer. Uh, so for us, the split is very clear. It's 90% engineers, 10% uh, uh, people who are working on the product uh, design. And then uh, we have, I think, a total of two auxiliaries. So the, the, and then I think the, to the earlier question about what was the other dynamic there is that the age is very young. So I think something like 70% or 80% is below 30. So that, that culture is very, very different uh, when uh, the, the diversity is so high. So I think that that's the insight for us. Yeah, do you want to add on, Cleo? Yeah, I think that the split for us uh, we see different products that we do is like more of a playhouse where people can pick and choose what product they want to do. So in terms of like setting, you know, how many people do what, but I think also that we treat people first because at the end it's about the, the product lead or the engineer, what do they want to work on and really build things that are scalable. So we don't just set like, okay, what is the number of engineer per product, but they can see the traction. And if the business has traction, um, for example, the things that we are working on very recently, uh, which is building not just Mitra, but merchant. So empowering the uh, store owners. Uh, again, I think that's coming back to the omni-channel, right? So omni-channel meaning that um, our app is being used by the merchant 
uh, when they sell car, they sell the car insurance, used car, or when they sell phone, they sell the phone insurance. Uh, but actually, in uh, the Roxy Mas, not uh, just Shopee or Tokopedia and whatnot, but the Roxy Mas. And because it has traction, the number of engineers goes more um, to that, right, by itself. So it's a living organism of living organization uh, that will attract more talent, right? So I think it's not just about setting per um, what's the number, et cetera, what's the ideal, but as product have traction, it will attract more people to it, right? And uh, people believe that it's about being building an entrepreneurial organization. Thank you. So no simple answer to that. <laughs> I hope that answer your question, Pak Paul. No? Do you want to ask follow-up question? As on today, how many percent? Yeah, so in terms of the number of engineers, we have about maybe, you know, close to about half-half, 40, 50 percent, right? But I think what I mentioned is, uh, it's not just about the tech, but the pr the problem we are working on, they keep changing the number of engineers in one project. So 50-50, Paul. All right. <laughs> okay. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes. We have a hand raised in the middle. And right after this question, we'll take on the question from Slido. Thank you. Uh, I am Uke from Mandiri, from Aksa Mandiri. Uh, digitalization will change the insurance business model. Uh, and bank insurance is the most possible to transform first. So because you know, bank insurance has partnership with the bank and uh, let's say Bank Mandiri. Mandiri Bank currently we have around 50 million ecosystem, 20 million living downloader, and 8 million monthly active user. So as we aware, bank assurance luxury that the lead coming from the human, coming from the bank staff, coming from the RM. But in the future, the lead will coming from engine. So proper safety meddling, data analytic, trigger even, will play important role in the future. We have discussed with big five uh, uh, consultant, but no one can share to us with the best recipe to has good transformation in the bank insurance. So do you, do you, uh, we really appreciate if you can share which banker or maybe in other countries, I don't know, in Europe, maybe in US or in China, which the best uh, recipe to transform from people to engine. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Who would like to take this question on? You, okay, you. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I could provide some examples, but I don't really want to name specific companies because things are happening, right? And, and I think there's two, two key areas to focus on, right? One is your data factory, right? And data analytics factory. And then you've got to take the logical step to say, actually, that's got to be the bank's data and analytics factory, right? So you've got to have a really good relationship with your bank and work very, very closely um, on that. And then once you've got that and there's that ability to integrate data, the banks, as you've said, have enormous amount of data that can give you, for example, really good indicators of when someone's entering a phase of their life where they're more likely to be wanting to buy a life insurance product. So that kind of propensity to buy information combined with good content marketing should put you in a really good position and then you can have entry level products which are digital only as well. That's one area. I think the other area for me personally and kind of George talked about this a little bit around omni-channel, right? And um, I think there needs to be a sea change in terms of how relationship managers um, look at their jobs, and they need to be digitally enabled. So one of my key gripes around bank assurance is it's all about the bank or insurer brand, but you don't ever know who the RM is, right? So why don't we give those people a digital presence online? Why don't we allow their customers to contact them as well and bring that human touch through a digital interface? So there's a couple, couple of areas there that I think. So I'm not, I don't think it's 
it's de digital only, right? It's going to be omni and how we bring the two together. Thank you, Hugh. Cleo? Yeah, I think just a very small thing to add uh, is maybe if we could consider beyond just bank assurance means more than just bank, right? So it doesn't have to just be bank, maybe. Uh, I want to take an example, say in China, the partnership of insurance company with the likes of Alibaba selling micro health insurance gets about 100 million uh, users uh, that buys insurance in such a short time. So maybe if we expand, uh, bank is one thing, but uh, I think if we could expand beyond banks, it could be interesting as well uh, for the um, audience. Thank you. Thank you. I got to ask you, Pa Omar, from ex Mandirian, what's your view? My view, um, I think Aksa Mandiri is in a sweet spot. You are blessed with plus 50 million uh, accounts and relationship. So the name of the game for you is, is how to penetrate further on that ecosystem, on that closed loop relationship. Uh, but also second to what Cleo is saying, uh, beyond banking, the Indonesian population I think is rife. In the next five to seven years, it's rife to be disrupted through technology. And, and it's how to configure the products and the services. And, and the key here, the word is overused, it's seamless, but I would like to use the word invisible because of the complexity of the insurance product itself. And surveys have, have uh, proved that insurance, it is complex. So how, do you, how you weaved that products and services so that it is you, you don't feel it. You are aware of the protection. You know the risk of not taking and the risk of taking insurance product, but how to bundle, how to leverage, and how to package those uh, insurance product into the banking. So bank insurance has been, uh, the, the channel has been growing uh, tremendously. I think it's bigger than the agency channel. But the, the bigger question is how to protect the average Indonesian because it's 275 million people. And like uh, Cleo said, there's one example already in China. And one app in China, what we knew, uh, what we learned from the competitors in China, they have been successful to have seven interaction in a day per customer. So they have figured out something. So how can we transfer that success into Indonesia? Maybe Pasar Polis can do it. Maybe Bank Mandiri can do it through that 50 million relationship. Maybe Prudential or other insurance company can collaborate together. Thank you, Pak Omar. Hope that answer your question, Pak Uka. I, I just add a very quick one. So actually, we're, we're I'm releasing a white paper on the digital banking. So if you, it's a bit of a teaser, but uh, you, if you link up with me on LinkedIn, uh, you'll see it coming out in two weeks' time. So we have some, some interesting insights there as well. Thank you, George. Let me just go to the slide, though, since we have many questions here. We don't have many, much time. Um, the question, I think this is for you, Cleo. It's very interesting. Insurance company will never be able to compete with insure tech like you, Pasar Polis, since we are playing off a different set of regulation. What do you think about that? I, I think in if... I always believe that history repeats itself, uh, meaning that it's the same thing that could have happened in China, for example. Digital insurance grows about 26 times, but the industry also grows 10 times with it. Uh, and I actually don't think insure tech or digital insurance are competing against um, you know, uh, insurance company. I think it's more collaborate. Uh, we are strong in two areas, basically building the digital distribution and technology. But in terms of product, I, I do hope that Indonesia being such a large country can actually, uh, we could collaborate with people like you because it is people like you that are very important in really making insurance to be available for all. So it's not us only, we have limited, you know, you know I guess, Capital is one thing, uh, product experience, underwriting actuary, and I think it is about collaborating together uh, to really go and get this massive market. So it's not about competing, it's about collaboration and partnership. Second question, uh, maybe this is for you, George. Um, is there any live insurance company around the world 
that's successful only through selling through digital? I think it's, uh, it's the question that is yet to be answered because uh, we do see examples that have worked well, but I wouldn't say that it's something that is a runway success yet. Uh, and when I say that runway success, would, uh, to me it means that they were successful in the country that they started in, and then they were able to bring that innovation to multiple markets. Uh, I, I, I can think of the examples of the companies that have been very successful in their domestic markets, but they weren't able to really scale that innovation uh, across. So this is, I think, uh, we, we're on the verge of that. I think there is going to be more of that innovation coming in. Uh, but I think this is something that is yet not happened. Maybe one more question to you. How should we control fraud in life insurance business selling through digital? Uh, I think that's a very, very important question and I'm glad that it came up. To me, the question of fraud uh, is something that is very close to DNA of the insurance. And I think this is what creates a lot of the complexity and a lot of the things that we kind of naturally inherited. So I think what happens in fraud is that we, we just need to be more risk accepting and use data than to, to iterate and to weed out the fraud. Uh, especially if we think about the smaller type of products, there is gonna be naturally a lot of uh, propensity for people to abuse it. We've seen that in the COVID products, for example, where people just completely abused it, right? They bought six insurance policies, then they want to see their friends who have COVID uh, to receive the payout. Which is, which is, uh, I think, very unfortunate, but this is something that we just, it, it's not something that we need to deny and, and prevent, but we need to figure out how to navigate it using data. Thank you. Maybe one last question from the Slido for you, Cleo. You showed a slide um, of digital growth in China, and earlier you said that Indonesia is on the brink of this growth. Does GDP per capita level play a role in this growth? Uh, I think so, uh, because um, insurance is typically not the first product people buy, right? It would be after, you know, savings, lending, etc. cetera. Um, but I think GDP of Indonesia, whether it's now 4,000 or crossing that, and I think it starts to be very interesting. Uh, it's also uh, one thing is about uh, how we could make insurance to be more of a cool product, then it would also help to uh, lower down that threshold. Uh, I mean, it's a valid question. I think GDP has, um, of course, an impact to, to, to that growth as well. Thank you. May I summarize this session that we have to embrace the digital world. It is by default the critical enabler for us to recover stronger and sustainably. Um, this is the industry um, that needs to be supported by digital going forward. Let's thank all the fine, uh, panelists one more time. Give a big round of applause. George Kasselman, Pa Omar Chawaldi, Abamuar, Hugh Terry, and Cleo Sandranding. Sekarin Sukarnain, thank you so much. All panelists are requested to remain on stage to receive token of appreciation. We would like to invite Mr. Jos Chandra from AAJI Board to come on stage to present token of appreciation.